Welcome back, Zedheads, for another episode of Astro and Chill. We're going to park Ptolemy today, just for a week or so. Because recently I've been very, very called for some reason to begin talking about the lunation cycles and synodic cycles. There's only one person who really springs to mind for me where these are concerned. And that would be an astrologer known as Dane Woodyer, born in 1895, I think. So quite a lot more modern than Ptolemy, um, with a vast body of work behind him. A real pioneer of what we would call modern transpersonal astrology, went on to inspire a lot of modern astrologers. And in particular, we are going to be reading from his works called The Lunation Cycle. And Aurora Press have very, very kindly given us permission to do so. So what I would like to do over the next few weeks or so is begin by looking at what we mean by the pattern of the Lunation Cycle. We can then go on and look at different lunar personalities because, of course, we were all born under a certain phase of the moon and that can add a whole heap of, of extra dimension and information when we analyse a natal chart. But today we will begin with our introduction to how the lunation cycle works. So, as ever, get yourselves comfortable. Turn on, tune in, and drop out. The pattern of the lunation cycle. The relationship of the moon to the sun proceeds according to a wave pattern of increase and decrease in light, or separation from and return to the sun. The cycle begins at the new moon when the moon is lost in the brilliancy of the sun. A day or so later, the thin crest of the moon appears in the western sky after sunset. At the first quarter, the moon is half full and elevated at the zenith while the sun sets. The zodiacal distance between the two lights keeps increasing as the moon also increases in roundness and in light until moonrise in the east coincides with sunset in the west. The rays of the setting sun run alongside the surface of the earth to become reflected in the lunar mirror. Because she is completely distant, yet face to face with the sun, the moon has become truly the equal of the sun. She can release the fullness of the sun through the night to earth creatures who can now receive the solar seed idea in its completeness, who can commune with the sun by assimilating the fullness of the lunar Eucharist. Then, as if because of her gift to the earth, the moon gradually depossessed of her light seems to slow her motion in order to draw closer to the sun, yearning for his radiance. At the last quarter phase, she is seen at the zenith, while the sun rises. Even stronger, the pull toward the sun compels her to rise later and later in the night, until about three days before the cycle's end. She rises as dawn already begins to colour the eastern sky. The following days she is seen no longer, lost as she is in the exalted light of the sun. She communes with the sun to be filled once more with the potency of light, that she might be able to make it a gift to earth creatures again. This poetic and symbolic story of the lunation can be resolved, geometrically speaking, into a cyclic series of angular values. 
the solilunar relationship can be measured in terms of degrees and minutes of arc. And this gives us the cold mathematics of astrological aspects. The terms, aspects and phases are interchangeable for both can be given either a sensorial or an abstract and algebraic meaning. The dictionary defines phases as the different luminous appearances presented by the moon and several of the planets, the variety of the amount of surface visible from the earth being termed phases, and the abstract meaning is stated to be the following. In uniform circular motion or in a cycle of periodic changes, phase defines the point or stage in the period to which the rotation or oscillation has advanced, considered in its relation to a standard position or assumed instant of starting. The lunation cycle is a cycle of periodic changes, but let us remember changes in the soli lunar relationship and not in the position of the moon in reference to a theoretically static point such as a fixed star. The assumed instant of starting of the lunation cycle is the conjunction of the sun and the moon, at which time the distance in longitude between the two celestial bodies equals zero degrees. The instant of maximum distance between them, 108 degrees, is the opposition. The moon increases simultaneously in light, fullness and distance from the sun during her waxing period, from conjunction to opposition, then decreases likewise during the waning period, from opposition to conjunction. The opposition constitutes the cresting of the soli lunar wave rhythm. The conjunction indicates the trough. In between these two phases, the most typical appearances of the moon are known as the crescent moon and the first and last quarters. These occur both during the waxing and during the waning period. The crescent is most characteristically seen about two days after the new moon. What gives added significance to this crescent phase is the fact that a faint image of the full disk of the moon is usually visible in clear skies. As a continuation of the crescent shape, thus the crescent gives us as it were a promise of the full moon an anticipation of the fullness of light which is to come. Yet this light at the crescent phase is solar light reflected by the earth upon the moon. It is earth shine. Symbolically speaking, this light is the light which comes to the adolescent from the collective, general, ideals or purposes of his race. It is not directly solar, i.e. individualized spirit, but spirit as it reaches the individual consciousness through a double reflection. It is the spirit as an unconscious collective revelation inherent in human nature. In the waning period of the moon, the crescent shape is inverted, turning eastward, and the point reached as this typical shape is formed by subtraction of light this time has been called in alchemical schools of astrology the balsamic moon a term whose derivation appears unknown this phase of the waning moon symbolizes in one sense the final letting go of the seed of the cycle about to end it also represents the moon's entrance into the sanctuary of the solar realm and as she enters, she brings to the sun, as it were, the new need of the earth. She is the mother, or beloved, petitioning the divine spirit in the name of confused and disintegrating earth creatures. 
she is the penitent, asking for mercy, the nun offering her prayers for the sake of humanity, lost in sin. She is the incense or prayer rising to the sun, calling for a new revelation, a new messiah, a new outpouring of spirit and light through a new lunar structure, a new body, a new image of reality, a new concept to resolve man's ever-recurrent doubts and uncertainties. During the crescent phases, the moon is from 18 to 36 degrees distant from the sun. The period centers around the 30 degree relationship of the moon to the sun, a semi-sextile aspect. A distance of 45 degrees is called a semi-square. This important aspect represents in the waxing period, the end of the subjective period of the lunation cycle and the definite entrance into the realm of objective manifestation. This realm is also one of struggles and conflicts, where a new concrete structure or mental concept can only become manifest on grounds that have been cleared from the remains of previous structures or concepts. The 45 degree phase of the moon does not yet refer to the clearing up process itself, but rather to the first shock of the discovery of the objective world. It is then that the new concept and the youthful personality are confronted with the previous concepts filling the mind, or with the many personalities in the wide world who are apparently alien and potentially antagonistic. The semi-square and the 60 degree aspect which follow in the lunation cycle do not produce easily recognizable lunar shapes. They are transitory steps which lead to the first quarter phase. The growing inside curve of the crescent moon has now become a straight line which produces a distinctive semi-circular appearance and it is only at these two quarter phases that the moon's shape includes a straight line. The meaning suggested is that of cleavage, of a cutting through and also of duality or division in two. Indeed, the quarter phases are symbols of crisis. The first quarter represents a crisis in action, the last quarter a crisis in consciousness. They bring to a focus the very quality of change. They are moments when the dynamic and also the restless character of the entire cyclic process of organic growth and dissemination appears in gradual revelation or assimilation of the image or concept released at the new moon is stressed. And this reason is the earth creature's inability to commune directly and instantaneously with the solar spirit. If man could become identified at will and immediately with the spirit, there would be no need for the moon to serve as a mediatrix as a builder of transient organic or intellectual structures. The first quarter phase of the lunation compels the growing personality to face his subservience to time. His inability to commune with his soul source is God in an eternal now. It is a moment of basic dissatisfaction with self yet also a time of challenge to the self. Man made to realize that he is only human, that he is caught in the wheel of change, that this is his way, either grows positively to the fullness of the particular revelation which the coming full moon promises to him, or fails to clear up the ground of his mind still crowded with the shells of past structures. 
the square aspect of the moon to the sun during the waxing period of the lunation can thus be interpreted both as a sign of clear-cut repudiation of the past and as a symbol of the building of new organic or mental structures needed to receive the soulless seed released at the full moon. It can mean either type of action, and it can and should mean both simultaneously. If, however, the repudiation of the past is not definite enough, and the building of new functions and organs proceeds only half-heartedly, then a negative response to the opportunity for growth and illumination offered by this particular lunation cycle becomes established. Mental hesitancy and a basic confusion of values sap the power to act or to build. Whatever is said during this critical stage of the lunation keeps on developing for better or for worse. After the square aspect, 90 degrees, comes the trine, 120 degrees, and the sesky quadrate aspect, 135 degrees, which play within the second sector of the cycle, the part which is the semi-square and the sextile, 45 degrees and 60 degrees respectively, played within the first sector. These phases are known as the gibbous moon. Finally, the full moon is reached. The opposition aspect, 180 degrees of the sun and the moon. If a positive attitude of growth and of liberation from the remains of the past has prevailed during most of the waxing period, the full moon brings to the earth organism at the physical or the psychomental level, some sort of fulfillment, illumination or revelation. The new solar image, the new message from the creative spirit, is received in clear, objective consciousness. It assumes a state of concreteness, that is, of full perceptibility or intelligibility. This state implies some sort of contrast, a black and white, dark and light dualism, without which no objective realization of form is possible for man. This means in practice that some new factor is given a high valuation and that as a consequence an old value is either altogether repudiated or placed under a new light in contrast to the new realization. This in turn may produce a definite reorientation of everyday activities or a new statement of purpose, a man's purpose being the result of the nature and the quality of his response, positive or negative, to the images released within him by the spirit or son. If, however, the individual has met the waxing period of the lunation, and especially the first quarter phase, with a hesitant or entirely negative attitude, that the sun and the moon represent two definitely antagonistic and irreconcilable orders of life is the great illusion. It is the illusion of separateness which sets the mind, moon, against the spirit, sun. The ego, a psychic structure whose evolutionary purpose is to develop objective clarity of consciousness through individual differences, against the spiritual self, a power of integration seeking the fullest possible inclusiveness. This illusion of separateness destroys the vital essence of relationship even if the outer forms remain as shells. It is the denial of relatedness, and the mind which becomes pervaded with it is only able to see the sun and the moon as two unrelated alien 
and forever conflicting factors, each with its own independent cycle of positions, instead of as joint participants in a true cycle of relationship, delunation. Such a kind of seeing or belief constitutes the first step upon the path of disintegration and destruction, where hate comes to supersede love, where the ego establishes within itself a current of forces which ultimately makes the connection between ego and self, intellect and spiritual mind, snap. This is the so-called black path, because that path destroys both the lights by separating them. It makes the soul of power ineffective, and the structures built by the lunar mind-ego spiritually lifeless. What is spiritually lifeless is like a dark void. Nature abhors a vacuum, it is said. And indeed, some kinds of energies will soon crowd in, drawn by and into this void. The energies of decay, of an earth substance deprived of light, unless an aseptic condition is established by some superior protective agency. We might add here that an astrological practice, which completely isolates for analysis the various elements of a chart, and sees everywhere cycles of positions, where actually cycles of relationship are the only vital reality. Such a practice provides us with a symbol of ultimately destructive intellectualism. It is a lunar kind of astrology. The astrologer who, on the contrary, proceeds from the point of view of the spirit, begins and ends with the relatedness of all factors within the birth chart, with the total and holistic image of the whole. He sees the name of the person or life situation in an act of intuitive perception and does not merely spell letters forever unrelated. However, while saying this, I do not intend to separate solar from lunar values, holistic perception from intellectual dissection, synthesis in meaning from differentiation through analysis. I am simply pointing to a condition which illustrates the basic distinction between the positive and negative approaches to knowledge. It is at the symbolic full moons of human evolution that these two approaches are seen in the clearest possible contrast. But this contrast is not to be considered as a glorification of the sun and a depreciation of the moon, opposing the solar to the lunar, in the sense of there being an irreconcilable enmity between the two. The negative approach is that which believes in such an irreconcilable enmity between solar and lunar forces, and even more in the utter lack of relationship between them. The positive approach, on the other hand, stresses constantly the relatedness of sun and the moon within their cycle of relationship, the lunation cycle, as it also seeks to build within man the power of forever relating the lunar character of the psychic structures of consciousness, mind-ego, to the solar power of the spiritual will and purpose of the self. It is only as a result of such a relationship that creative meaning develops within the truly individualized and integrated human person. The development of creative meaning takes place symbolically during the waning period of the lunation. The full moon brings to the earth conditioned personality of man, a new vision, a revelation, a sense of fulfillment and renewed purpose provided, of course, 
it is met in a positive manner. But the new image and the new organic realization of life are not ends in themselves. They climax a process, but the process itself, as we already saw, is only a means to an end, a creative end. At the psychological level, this creative end is the release of a biological seed which will perpetuate life. At the psychomental level, the goal is the dissemination of the idea conceived of the image behold. Beheld. It is the incorporation of the meaning of idea and image into the fabric of society and of civilization. This is a man's work. The sun releases his spiritual emanation at the new moon. But this creative word is not directly usable by human collectivity. It is not a concrete structure. It is only a vibration, a rhythmic impulse, a tone. Through the waxing half of the lunation cycle, this tone becomes progressively embodied in lunar structures. And at the full moon, it shines forth in cool glory in the night sky of human consciousness, blotting out the distant stars as intellectual concepts blot out the radiant but very remote spiritual intuitions of the primitive mind. It is the burden of responsibility of the individual person to make this full moon image his own. The solar tone becomes a vital realization in man only as the individual succeeds in integrating the polar rhythm of sun and moon, of spirit and mind. But this is not the end. It is only the beginning of the human period of the cycle. During the last half of the lunation, man has to do consciously what spirit accomplished in the unconscious darkness of the new moon phase. Man, as conscious individual, is to fecundate society. He is to disseminate the seed of the future civilization. He is to build the form of tomorrow. He is now the sun illumined moon, the creative two as one. He has to shed his light in order to satisfy the need of his people, his race humanity as a whole. As the moon wanes in the sky, so the illumined individual vanishes into his spiritual progeny. The civilizer's light is being absorbed into the fabric of the new civilization, the new earth. Every cycle of relationship divides itself into two hemicycles. The waxing hemicycle is a period of spirit emanated or generic instinctual activity which witnesses the triumph of life. The waning hemicycle is a period of individual and conscious, man-controlled release of creative meaning, or else in a negative sense, of gradual disintegration of material vehicles. The keynote of the first half of the cycle is spontaneous and instinctual action. The keynote of the second half is conscious growth in meaning and immortal selfhood. And the only true kind of conscious growth implies sharing meaning and value with others by means of adequate formulation, for no individual can gain real immortality personal or social, except as a participant in the activity of an immortal whole. Thus understood, both the new and the full moon constitute their four beginnings. The new moon is the starting point of the realm of life. The full moon opens up the realm of man's spiritual identity of man's individual immortality.
counting from the full moon as from a point of beginning, the angular values of the solilunar relationship are the same as those I interpreted when the new moon was taken as the starting point. But now the aspects computed from the full moon represent human and conscious values, while those calculated from the new moon referred to a process attempting to build consciousness, but stemming from the unconscious tone released from the sun. We saw that the first quarter phase times a crisis in action, when the expanding power of the life relationship has to express itself both in a repudiation of the past and of factors alien to the relationship and in the building of new concrete instrumentalities, organisms or faculties. The last quarter phase symbolizes a moment of crisis in the formulation and the sharing of meaning and value with other human beings. In the negative sense, however, this last quarter phase is a time of crucial disintegration, a breakdown of the tone of the relationship. This tone is a sustaining factor throughout the cycle, and in any case, its energy gradually exhausts itself during the waning fortnight of the moon. But where the full moon illumination has been positively received and assimilated by the individual, a new kind of power has appeared, the power of creative meaning and of a consciously willed purpose. That power develops in counterpoint to the waning energy of the instincts. The tone becomes fainter, but the power of the well-formulated and assimilated vision spreads throughout the individual's social following or spiritual group, which in return sustains the individual financially, socially and psychically. Thus we are actually confronted in the lunation cycle and in any cycle of relationship with two kinds of power, the power of instinct and the power of creative consciousness. The aspects or phases of the waxing hemicycle are steps in the process of organic and instinctual growth. Those of the waning hemicycle are steps in the conscious process of creative release through which the full moon illumined individual gains at least some small degree of immortality. The traditional type of astrology the traditional type of astrology does not, however, recognize this distinction between the two types of aspect, as likewise, it makes but a very vague mention of the difference between the aspects produced by cycles of positions and those formed by cycles of relationship. In other words, astrologers give as a rule the same significance to a first quarter and a last quarter square aspect. If the moon is on the first degree of Cancer, while the sun is located on the first degree of Aries, the square thus formed is a first quarter square. But if the moon were on the first degree of Capricorn, she would form a last quarter square to the sun. However, Practically all astrologers would consider that these squares have exactly the same significance as squares. Moreover, if the sun is at the first degree of Aries and the moon is at the first degree of Pisces, thus coming ever closer to a new moon, the astrologer says that the moon and the sun form a semi-sextile, 30 degree aspect. Yet, the moon is nearing the end of the lunation cycle, past her balsamic phase. In the sky she can be seen as an old crescent, about to disappear in the glow of dawn, and not as a new crescent, 
emerging from sunset, as would be the case if the moon were at the first degree of Taurus, and the sun at the first degree of Aries, also a distance of 30 degrees. This means that astrology usually considers the angular distance between two planets as a thing in itself, as a separate factor unrelated to the cycles of relationship between these planets. It can only see and study aspects as spatial or angular factors, and not as products of actual motion in real, experienceable time. This distinction is a very capital one, for as we already saw, man's approach to time defines essentially his basic attitude to life and spirit, to himself and to God. What the astrologer ordinarily does is to take a snapshot of one cross-section of the eternal and universal flow of activity, which we experience as the world, and to analyse the complex pattern of dots and lines marked on the photograph as if these were static factors. By thus arresting the flow of time, the astrologer analyses death and lets life escape, just as scientists often do in their laboratory experiments and their dissections. The astrologer today does not deal with the living human experience of the sky and of the cyclic motions of the celestial bodies. He deals with static space patterns, not with dynamic functions, with forms, compulsions of objective time, and not with the creative freedom of subjective duration. It is only in rare cases that the aspects between planets in a modern astrological chart are given different values according to the actual cycles of motion and the relative speeds of the component planets. In horary astrology, a definite stress is made upon the distinction between forming and separating aspects, that is, on which planets of the two is the faster and thus will pass over the other. But this distinction is not given a broad enough meaning, because it does not include actually taking in consideration the complete cycle of relationship formed by the motions of these two planets. The horary astrologer will say that if the moon is at 28 degrees Aquarius and the sun is at 1 degrees in Aries, the semi-sextile aspect between them is forming, while if the moon is at 3 degrees Pisces and the sun is at 1 degree Aries, the semi-sextile is a separating aspect but this is taking only a narrow view of the entire situation. What should be done is to differentiate definitely between the two kinds of semi-sextiles represented by a moon in Pisces and one in Taurus in relation to the sun in Aries, or between the type of square which is a first quarter aspect and the type which is a last quarter aspect. And this applies not only to aspects between the moon and the sun, but as well to the aspects formed by any two planets, especially by two planets which have a definite polar relationship, such as Mars and Venus, Jupiter and Mercury. Such a distinction requires that the astrologer should become used to thinking in terms of cycles of relationship, rather than in terms of static angular relationships, in which the order of the belated planets can be reversed without altering the relationship. 
yet as I have implied at the beginning of this first part of our study, human experience and the subjective duration which is the soul are not reversible. Only mathematical abstract time is reversible and it is a symbol of death. Spiritual immortality is not reached through becoming abstract. It is the fruition and the seed of a cycle fulfilled in creativeness. It is the self-perpetuated individuality or quintessence of a completed cycle of subjective duration and not an escape into timelessness from objective time and its compulsions. If you're still awake, if you are still with us, <laughs> I do hope you enjoyed that and join me next time for some more Astro and Chill. But for now, night night and sweet dreams.